work rather when he finds us in the middle of our wandering. And when he says, do you know who I am? We breathe that sigh of relief and say, yes, you're the one I've been waiting for all this time. You're the one that I've longed for with my head, and with my heart, and in the pit of my stomach. You are the Almighty. You are our Father. And in our story, it's different because God's not uh, an absentee or absent-minded parent that sort of took off and left us on our own. But like the Are You My Mother story, human beings are very much like the lost bird. We're very much the, the kind of creature that wanders from God to God, from danger to danger, from thing to thing, saying, Are you my mother? Or whatever it happens to be. As humans, part of who we are, our very identity, is that we're searchers. We, we look for something because we need something to complete us. Pascal said that, that every human being has inside of them uh, a God-shaped vacuum, a God-shaped hole. And, it's, and it's, we, we look to fill that hole with sexuality, technology, money, drugs, uh, power. We think our desire will be satiated if we get enough of, of something. And it's not always the, the negative stuff that we look to to uh, complete us in our search. We also look to human relationships, where we try to, to, to build something that's good. Uh, maybe health and exercise will fulfill us. Maybe if we really study hard and we get smart enough, that's the thing that will bring us, that will fill that, that longing and, and, and bring us the thing that we've always been looking for. And we ask ourselves, if I do this enough, if I accomplish enough, if I go along this path enough, will that bring me home? Will that make me okay? Will that, that give me peace and, and joy? Humanity is hungry, and I believe that the human condition is that the search is on. And, uh, Pascal, right. Uh, but the only thing that can fill that heart that, that hard hole, that, that thing, is, is relationship with God, which we find in Jesus Christ. So in our passage, uh, you have Paul, and he shows up in this city of, of Athens, uh, read in the light of our, um, it, it's a city that's kind of like Venice, maybe, a city where uh, there's every kind of expression of, of, of every, every, everything you can, you can possibly imagine. But read in the light of, of the story we just read, we might call the city of Athens the city of the, the lost birds. The market when where Paul preached the gospel was the, the, the marketplace of, of good ideas for feathered orphans. And the Areopagus where Paul spoke was, uh, with the philosophers might have been called the, the intellectual birds uh, library and searching spot. And you think that Paul's a, a Bible guy, right? He's, he's, he's a, a religious guy. You'd think that if somebody would, would be repelled by all this searching, it would be the Bibly re religious guy. Paul seems like a very stark contrast to wandering birds. He knows what he believes, and he proclaims it fearlessly and, 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 and all the rest of it. Paul wrote more of the New Testament than, than anyone else, and 2,000 years later, he gives us most of our Christian theology. And... and, and this Paul, this apostle chosen by God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, you'd think that he'd be repelled by all these re religious people and, and, and kind of like shut the door on them or, or say something judgmental. But Paul recognized that he too had that same God-shaped vacuum that everybody else has. Paul, even in idolatrous Athens, knew that there's not two kind of people in the world. There's one kind of people, and that's the kind of person that needs... God, the kind of people that need God. But one kind of person is the kind of person that needs God. And it was Paul who wrote, would write later on to Timothy, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Uh, in other words, all of us would do well to recite this and remember it uh, well. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So this Paul shows up in the city of Lost Birds, and having some time to look around, the scripture tells us that he was, he was distressed at seeing all the idols. Other uh, translations, like King James, have things like his, his soul was in I might not mean to, his soul was in anguish. Uh, so, so he's 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 grieved by all this 
long-term spirituality by all these this clinging onto uh, false hopes that, that he's seeing around him. And he walks through the street, seeing shop front after shop front, woodworkers and metal vendors creating their, their best gods, maybe hens and dogs and, and boats and planes and junk out cars and snorts. And he sees the people like little birds running around, calling out to these things, mother, and trying to nuzzle up to them. The cat is the really scary one, I think. No words. <laughs> But the thing that, 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 that strikes me is that when Paul sees all this evidence of, of lostness, his reaction is not outrage. His, his reaction is not condemnation. His reaction is compassion. And the passage reminds me of, of Jesus when he had all the, the, the crowds pressing in on him. Uh, and he was tired to, to, to heal them and, and to teach them. And it says that Jesus looked out and he had compassion on the crowd. Paul was sad not mad when he saw the waywardness of Athens. So Paul starts to speak, he starts to teach in the marketplace, and he starts telling this, this strange counter-cultural story, uh, and he gets notice. And before you know, know it, the not know it, he's invited to this big Areopagus, this, this um, official philosophical uh, setting to, to speak. And, and what I like about in, in, in the book of Acts, it, it doesn't show it. Uh, well, it, it talks about the, the go gossip, but Luke gives this disparaging kind of parenthetical remark, kind of dissing uh, the city of, of Athens in his account of the story, where he says basically all these lazy people did is, is sit around and yap about the, the latest ideas and everything else. But as true as that went, was, again, Paul did not condemn them or write them off. Instead, he engaged them exactly where they were, not in his context, not waiting for, for them to, to, to come to the synagogue where he was used to speaking, but bringing the message to their place, to their venue, and to their context. Kind of reminds me of like being in a coffee house where we're speaking to work or something like that. And again, it's striking that one of the first things he does is he affirms their spirituality. He affirms their longing. If anyone had a right to sneer at these idolatrous talkers, it was Paul, but he didn't. He first, he said he brings up an idol that he saw in the city described to an unknown god. And, and the part that, 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 that shocks me is, is here's where you kind of expect the, the heavy religious hands to come down, but it doesn't. Paul's a Jew. He's raised with a familiarity and understanding of the Old Testament. The number one sin in the entire Old Testament, everywhere and always, is idolatry. That's that's, that's next door to the definition of sin, basically, is, is idolatry. He knows that that's the big one, not sexual sin, violence, slander, and the idolatry. And, and second, by the way, is um, not caring for the, 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 the widows and the fatherless and the orphans and the poor. Uh, okay, I lost where I am. <laughs> so Paul doesn't condone, he doesn't wink at their idolatry. He doesn't say, oh, it's not a big deal. Or he doesn't say, well, you know, it's, it's cool, it, 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 it'll, it'll work out. It's not that it's okay, but he understands the mystery that it's while we're sinners, it's while we're running the opposite way of God, saying, I can't care less of you. It's at that point that he dies for us and invites us into relationship with him in love. I heard uh, a pastor say one time that hate's not the opposite of love. Hate is misplaced passion. And it kind of uh, rang true with me that our greatest shortcomings and sin, they're not, often not the opposite of good, they're, they're twists or one-offs or <coughs> bent efforts or something, I don't know. So Paul saw the idols in Athens and he sees that the people's greatest shortcoming is that they're doing stupid things with a good longing, that God-shaped hole, that vacuum, that, that desire for joy and peace that we all have is a good thing. But we do strange things with it. And in Athens, it was as if people were birds looking for a home, coming, coming up to a dog and, and settling in and saying, this is my mother, I found what I'm looking for. So Paul tells the people, I even saw an idol inscribed to an unknown god. He, in effect, says, with an idol like this, it's clear that you haven't found your home yet. You're still looking for something. And he goes on to say, what you proclaim is unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. And Paul goes through the message. He proclaims that reconciliation with the one true God is possible and has been accomplished 
in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection from the dead. And he tells them in their vernacular, he quotes the, the, the songs of their poets, even, the rock stars uh, of the day. He's doing it in their venue, in their terms, taking a central object of their culture and their uh, top 40 or whatever, and he tells them who Jesus is, and he invites them into the life that's there for us in his name. Athens is a lot like Venice or Santa Monica or, or the, the, the west side. We live in a place where the search is on. We live in a place where the search is on in, in our own lives and in our own hearts. And we live in a place where there's all kinds of cows and cats and, and tractors and dogs saying, this is where you'll find the, the, the home your little bird heart is looking for. And as 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 and, and, and a lot of times uh, the uh, stop. <laughs> I've had this happen several, several several times this this week. And a lot of times, as people who who've been found in relationship with God because of, of Christ, who who experienced the joy, and we sometimes can can appear uh, a lot like a snort, <laughs> and. And uh, sometimes our culture's uh, uh, perception of Christians is, is like a snort. And, and sometimes Christians act a lot like that. So a, a snort, is, that thing was a, a huge machine. It could make a lot of noise. It could do a lot of damage. It could, it could do a lot of stuff. But the call, what I love about this story and, and, and seeing what, what Paul is doing and having compassion on the people is that the opportunity is for us snorts that we are to to proclaim the message, proclaim the good news, and bring those those little birds into the, the nest, into the knowledge, which is true, which is the gospel, that God loves us and God invites us into relationship with Him in Christ. And there's nothing that you have to do, and there's nothing you no test you have to write. And there's, there's nothing you can do before or after to earn it because of his grace and his love. Today, today is the day that, that God calls us into a uh, relationship with him. Amen. So, as recipients, as bearers of that message, when he says to us, do you know who I am? Again, we can say, yes, you're the one I've been waiting for. You're the one I've longed for. You're the one that, that, that my head has been trying to conceive of, the one that, that, that my heart has been bleeding for. You're the one that, that in the pit of my stomach I long for. You're the Almighty. You're the Creator. You are good. And I come to you. So let's come to Him now in prayer. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And we thank you that. It's, it's, it's you who make us, that, that there's nothing that we can do to earn it, but that just because of your grace and love, you invite us to live in a relationship with you. We just pray that that would be our reality right now. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come into our hearts, let us know you're there, comfort us, fill that hole within us. We pray this in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen. Amen. We're busy on that, right? We're going to, uh, I, I invite you.